Hello everyone. In this video, I'll be covering the process of ephrocytosis, which roughly translates to uh, to take to the grave, and is is the process by which apoptotic cells are cleaned up by macrophages. So I'll take these concepts and then I'll review this great paper by Wang et al. titled "Mitochondrial Fission Promotes the Continued Clearance of Apoptotic Cells by Macrophages." Hope you enjoy. Nephrocytosis is the process by which apoptotic cells are phagocytosed and degraded by macrophages, such as uh, microglia, which I added because I'm a neuroscience kind of guy. So there are four, um, four stages of ephrocytosis. The, the first stage can be summarized as apoptotic cells releasing find me signals to attract macrophages. Macrophages will then seek out these apoptotic cells and bind to so-called eat me receptors. And then macro, uh, macrophages will phagocytose the apoptotic cell bodies. And finally, the uh, apoptotic cell bodies need to be efficiently degraded in lysosomes for uh, subsequent rounds of phagocytosis. The failure to efficiently dispose of apoptotic cells due to a defect in any of the above processes leads to an alternative, uh, very messy mechanism of cell death called necrosis. And necrosis is marked by the massive release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and it's, it's kind of just a complete mess. It's akin to uh, like an oil spill or a semi turning over on a freeway. It just creates a toxic uh, inflammatory environment for all of the, the local cells in the tissue. And you, it's definitely definitely something a, um, an animal would want to avoid. It's no surprise then that uh, defects in nephrocytosis contribute and may even uh, cause various autoimmune disorders, including, including uh, cystic fibrosis, COP, uh, COPD, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and has also been implicated in various neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. Many avenues of research in Alzheimer's disease uh, actually suggest the disease stems from excessive inflammation and the failure to dispose of aging and dying neurons uh, certainly wouldn't be good for surviving neurons. So ephrocytosis is an important process in, in any disease that's marked by the death of the cells. Because if there's cells dying, then ephrocytosis is going to be critical to cleaning up those dead cells. Okay, so let's examine this process and some of the related pathways in more detail. So to begin with our process of ephrocytosis, we're going to start with our apoptotic cell. So our, our apoptotic cell is undergoing apoptosis, and this leads to the expression of caspases including, uh, most importantly, the effector caspases, three and seven, the executioner caspases, as, as they're called. And these caspases are actually going to be activating uh, via cleavage of the DEVD uh, sequence. They're going to be activating these two proteins, which I'll show here. It's going to be activating both of them via cleavage. Uh, one, one protein is ATP11A, and the other protein is uh, XKR8. And the cleavage uh, of these two proteins by these effector caspases, uh, cause it, it, it activates them. And what these proteins actually do is that they are flippases. So you've probably heard of a flippase maybe uh, somewhere in, in, a, in a cell biology class, but uh, maybe you've never heard of a specific uh, protein functioning as a flippase. Well, these are two very important caspase activated flippases that flip uh, phosphatidylserine uh, or PS. So let's say this is phosphatidylserine. It is a phospholipid that is almost always on the inner or the, the it's facing the inner layer of the membrane. So let's say this is the mem uh, plasma membrane or uh, phosphatidylserine is typically, it, it looks like this. It's facing the inner leaflet of, of the cell. During apoptosis, this XKR8 
ATP 11A activated by caspases will flip phosphatidylserine and face the and will now be on the outer leaflet of the apoptotic cell. And this is a really really a critical event in the um, beginning stages of efferocytosis. Before I move on, actually, I, I wanted to I forgot to mention this. I want to talk about find me signals. Find me signals. So the apoptotic cell will actually begin releasing uh, find me signals uh, to the outside world. Specifically, they're going to be releasing uh, nucleotides such as ATP or um, AMP or uh, UMP, just uh, various nucleotides. Um, I think uh, TTP um, or maybe TMP. Anyways, they're, they're, they're uh, nucleotide nucleotides that can be released and they are the primary find me signals that will be picked up by our macrophage, which I will draw now. Okay, so this will be our macrophage. And these find me signals will bind to, I think the most studied um, ATP receptor on a macrophage is a P2Y, is the P2Y class. They bind to various nucleotides. Uh, APT12, for example, binds uh, ATP. PY, P2Y12 binds ATP. And they're, they're, most of them are G proteins that will then lead to um, calcium transients or potassium or potassium. Anyways, it, it, they pr uh, promote the movement of macrophages towards the apoptotic cells. Uh, so they function as um, they, they create a concentration gradient that will uh, pull the macrophages towards the apoptotic cells. Okay, so let's move back to these uh, phosphatidylserines. So once the macrophage has been recruited by these find me signals such as ATP or AMP, these phosphatidylserines, these exposed phos phosphatidylserines, will start binding um, various factors that are either released by the macrophage or are currently on the macrophage. So once such factor that gets released by macrophages um, are called, or one is called GAS6, and the other is called MFG-E8, which is like stands for milk fat globule E8. These two proteins, uh, I call them find U signals. They're, they find uh, apoptotic cells. And what they do is they bind phosphatidylserines. They are basically soluble receptors that get released and they dis, uh, disperse, they diffuse throughout the extracellular matrix until they bind a cell with exposed phosphatidylserine. And then they latch onto that cell. And then if a macrophage comes around, it'll say to this macrophage, hey, you need to eat this cell. I found some phosphatidylserine. So we gas six. So gas six, MFG, E8, both bind to expose phosphatidylserine after they get released from the macrophage. Another important um, receptor on macrophages is this BAI8 or uh, B, B, BI1, BAA, BAI1. And BAI1 or BI1 can actually directly bind to phosphatidylserines. So BI1 is, it's recently been noticed for its ability to uh, promote the phagocytosis of live axons in the brain. It's also the primary uh, phosphatidylserine binding receptor in microglia. And BI1 is, is known to directly bind phosphatidylserine. One last thing that we haven't discussed yet is um, the, the class of so-called don't eat me signals. Don't eat me signals. And these are highly expressed on cancer cells because you may have known that cancer cells, one of the main mechanisms of destroying a cancer cell is through our immune system. Well, eventually cancer cells can develop ways to um, inhibit nearby macrophages or prevent macrophages from bothering it. And one of those ways is through the upregulation of CD, CD47. 
CD47 is one of these so-called don't eat me signals, which I'll have the little inhibitory sign. It says, don't eat me. And the way it does that is that CD47 can bind to a receptor on macrophages called SER, uh, SERP, SERP alpha. SERP alpha then inhibits calcium transients, or here, say it inhibits uh, calcium and potassium transients. So CD47 binds SERP alpha, and this prevents macrophage activation. So uh, the downregulation of CD47 would happen during apoptosis, or if a cell becomes uh, cancerous, it would be upregulating CD47 in order to uh, stave off the macrophages and prevent macrophages from bothering it. Um, but this is the general pathway by which uh, ephrocytosis is um, orchestrated by. Okay, for this slide, let's think about let's think about what happens to apoptotic bodies when they are getting phagocytosed. So the cell has basically died, and a macrophage has found it. Oops. In red, this is your macrophage. It's kind of enveloping the apoptotic bodies. This would be our macrophage, almost looks like a shark. So uh, we have our exposed phosphatidylserines. These are going to be the R phosphatidylserine that's been exposed. And for some of these, such as this one, let's say, let's say it has uh, M MFG E8, that's MFG E8 bound to it. That's the soluble factor that's released by macrophages and can diffuse and then bind apoptotic bodies. Well, when a, mic a macrophage encounters these MFG E8s, it tends to bind, bind them bind to them uh, using uh, mer, mer, K, uh, mer, mer TK, uh, MFG E8 receptor tyrosine kinase. Uh, another, well, let's just stick with that one. So uh, MFG E8 receptor tyrosine kinase, which will, well, we'll talk about in a second what it does. Um, gas, let's see, gas six, oops. Uh, gas six binds to um, what was it? Um, uh, gas six binds uh, to TAM, which I forget what it stands for. It's some it's some form of receptor. This is, sorry, it's supposed to be a receptor, but kind of running out of room. But the soluble gas six uh, functions as a ligand for the TAM receptor. Remember, we can also have. Um, um, you can also have uh, BI1 binding directly to the phosphatidylserines. So these these are the the main uh, mechanisms through which the macrophage will recognize the apoptotic bodies and initiate uh, phagocytosis. Sorry, there's also another guy that we want to talk about. TMM2. TMM2 is a receptor that binds something. I'll put a big question mark. They don't know how it binds, but it is a really important receptor for phagocytosis. And all these guys tend to converge, as I mentioned last slide, they tend to converge on the upregulation of calcium. The main way that they do that is, well, before writing calcium, I'll write the kind of the pathway. They lead to um, the, the activation of PLC, phospholipase C. Phospholipase C will cleave a phospholipid, a, um, phosphatidyl inositol, and it releases dias diacylglycerol, DAG. It's the two acyl units in the, in, in the glycerol, so it, cl it cleaves off the, um, the nucleotide component and just releases the diacyl and the glycerol. And it diffuses through the cytoplasm. Diacyl glycerol will then bind uh, to IP3, IP3 receptors, IP3R, so nositol phosphate 3 receptor. 
Oopsie. And this receptor is on the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum. So the endoplasmic reticulum, you might recognize or might know, it's kind of a calcium reservoir. So when diacylglycerol binds to uh, IP3R, it causes a calcium flux. It releases calcium. This release calcium activates uh, protein kinase C, among many others. And protein kinase C then will start, will, will orchestrate the phagocytic process through the activation of a bunch of different proteins um, that are mostly all involved in remodeling the uh, actin cytoskeleton. These are just a couple of the key players and they ultimately kind of converge around this, this main actin reorganizing protein called RAC1. And RAC1 is gonna be facilitating the, the closure of the phagocytic membrane. And at this point we have our, fat, phagos, uh, or our apoptotic body um, that has been phagocytosed. So the main, these, these um, GAS6, MFGE8, BI1, uh, TMEM2, they tend to converge on phospholipase C expression or activation, I should say, and the, uh, the dispatching of diacylglycerol to the endoplasmic reticulum causing, causing calcium transients and activating all these actin remodeling uh, proteins. Now that we have a, a good understanding of how ephrocytosis works, let's check out this recent paper by Wang et al. So while investigating the mechanisms of ephrocytosis, uh, Wang et al. noticed something unusual, that ephrocytosis was accompanied, sorry, was accompanied by mitochondrial fission or splitting. And it sounded like they stumbled on this fact by accident. Perhaps they were um, using a mitochondrial stain and maybe they noticed that uh, during ephrocytosis that the mitochondria were shorter, which I thought was uh, very interesting uh, as did they. And they decided to probe this a little deeper, and they found that by blocking mitochondrial fission using a DRP1 inhibitor, we'll discuss that in a second, but blocking mitochondrial fission significantly impaired calcium flux and the phagolysosomal degradation of apoptotic bodies. So essentially, when mitochondria could not split, mitochondrial trans or uh, calcium transients were dampened, and mitochondria... Uh, apoptotic bodies were not getting degraded, nor, nor were the, the phagosomes properly sealing. And this poses another interesting phenomenon, briefly discussed earlier, that calcium transients have long been associated with ephrocytosis, and they're generally involved in activating kinases like protein kinase C and some of the actin remodeling enzymes. So these calcium transients appear to be dependent on mitochondrial fission. The current study discovers a critical role of calcium flux in ephrocytosis that is triggered by DRP1-dependent mitochondrial fission. By blocking mitochondrial DRP1, and thus uh, mitochondrial fission, they blocked calcium transients. And this prevented apoptotic bodies from getting degraded and the uh, proper um, sealing of the uh, phagosomes. As for how mitochondrial fission promotes calcium flux, the authors provided some evidence that the mitochondrial MCU calcium uniporter, uh, which normally sequesters calcium, but when fo uh, following fission, the mitochondrial dissociate from the ER, and these MCU1 uh, uniporters no longer buffer calcium, and this allows the ER to release calcium into the cytosol, probably through those IP3R um, and the diacylglycerol signaling. So future research will probably be needed to better understand how cal or how mitochondrial fission induces calcium transients and exactly how these calcium transients uh, promote the rap rapid degradation of phagolysosomes. So given this, we're going to now uh, transition into a very short um, um, slide depicting the pathway that's, that's um, discussed in this paper. Okay, so real quick, uh, this is basically what we're looking at. So we have, uh, this is going to be 
late stage phagocytosis in here, we're going to have our um, apoptotic body. This is apoptotic body. And we have uh, lots of signaling through uh, uh, protein kinase, or not, uh, uh, protein kinase C and diacylglycerol. Um, and um, I guess protein kinase C isn't, isn't uh, I meant uh, uh, phospholipase C and diacylglycerol signaling. Remember these guys, this diacylglycerol likes to diffuse to the ER, where it binds to those IP3R receptors. Let's put an IP, IP3R receptor in here. And normally, when they, when they do bind to these receptors, they, they pry them open and they allow calcium to flood out into the cell where it ac activates um, protein kinase C. And this leads to uh, phagosome, uh, phagosome sealing and um, degradation. But there's a problem. They notice that um, mitochondria, when they were in their full length form, when they were not uh, split, they tend to bind to the ER these are called, called mitochondrial ER contact sites, and they actually inhibit the, uh, the, the diacylglycerol binding to the IP3R. And it might have something to do with these MCU transporters. It's getting a little bit cloudy. These MCU uh, uniporters are transporting calcium into the mitochondria and buffering calcium instead of letting calcium leave through the IP3R. So basically the idea is that phospholipase 3 is signaling through diacylglycerol and then to IP3R. The problem is mitochondria are, are binding to ER, the, the endoplasmic reticulum at these ER mitochondrial contact sites and that inhibit, prevents or uh, physically prevents the binding of di diacylglycerol to IP3R. What they found was that um, this um, phagocytosis leads to the upregulation of DRP1. And the big mystery in this paper is how. How does DRP1 get upregulated following the induction of phagocytosis? They have no idea. All they know is that there's an upregulation of protein and there's no change in mRNA. So I thought that was kind of interesting. That means the mRNA, that means the, the mRNA expression isn't upregulated, but translation is upregulated. So DRP1 is being upregulated. Uh, it could have something to do with phosphorylation or maybe acetylation or some other post-translational modification. But regardless, they found DRP1 is upregulated. DRP1 will then find these mitochondria and it'll start splitting them apart. This is my attempt to try and draw this. So bear with me. So imagine that was a mitochondria and DRP1 there we go. DRP1 has now split this mitochondria in half. It's now going to diffuse away from the ER mitochondrial contact sites. And this uh, removes the blockade and allows diacylglycerol to get to these IP3R receptors and release calcium. So DRP1 is really important to dissociating mitochondria from the ER so these IP3R receptors can release their calcium and lead to uh, phagosome sealing and the degradation of these apoptotic bodies in the uh, phagolysosomes. Also, I, I forgot to add exactly um, how DRP1 functions. I wanted to say a bit about that. DRP1 is a GTPase that oligomerizes um, across a mitochondria kind of like this. It oligomerizes and it produces a wrenching-like motion that's fueled by a GTPase. It's basically, it, they wrench together and they oligomerize tighter and tighter and tighter until eventually the membrane kind of looks like that. 
So you get this kind of weird looking um, formation and eventually the mitochondria split into two, something like that. So DRP1 is a, D, uh, a GTPase that oligomerizes at these ER mitochondrial contact sites and it causes the, the fission or the splitting of mitochondria. Apoptotic cell uptake induces mitochondrial fission. So in this immunofluorescence image down here, uh, we're seeing that mitochondria in red are much shorter following the phagocytosis of an apoptotic cell. This is AC positive condition, it's apoptotic cell positive condition. And since DRP1 is required for mitochondrial fission, uh, they decided to do a western blot up here in the corner. And you can see very clearly that when apoptotic cells are added, you see an upregulation in the uh, amount of DRP1 that's being expressed. And not shown here, but they also looked at mRNA and they did not see an increase in mRNA. So there's increased translation of the mRNA that is already present. Loss of DRP1 significantly impairs apoptotic cell uptake. So in this figure, they are blocking, um, in these two figures, they are blocking uh, mitochondrial fission in two ways. They are knocking out uh, DRP1 with a Cree uh, LOX system. So they have DRP1 uh, that is flanked by LOX P sites and an animal is expressing Cree. Uh, these DRP1 is going to be deleted in those cells. And the other, the other way of blocking DRP1 is just to use uh, siRNA, RNA that is complementary to the DRP1 RNA and it binds and causes its degradation. And you, you can see that in these two conditions of DRP1 inhibition, uh, it reduced the number of apoptotic cell positive macrophages by up, of upwards of 50%. So this measure is the number of cells that are positive for apoptotic bodies. Basically these um, calcine AMs I'm, I'm not familiar with what calcium is, but I know that this is a some, some measure of cells that have recently taken up an apoptotic body or an apoptotic cell. And the number of apoptotic cells is, is vastly reduced in these two conditions, roughly you know eight or nine or five, roughly 20 in this condition compared to the control condition of 50 and uh, control siRNA of around 25. So DRP1 is important for the uptake of apoptotic cells. The question now is why? What, what is, why do mitochondria need to be severed to efficiently phagocytose dead cells? Well, mitochondria are known to buffer calcium. This is what they're known to do. And calcium is required for phagocytosis. So they decide to look at calcium transients and see if there's any connection. They use this cal uh, calcium sensor dye, cyto uh, GECI, um, and it, it measures calcium flux. What they found is that uh, calcium transients were significantly blocked when DRP1 uh, wasn't around. So in these red conditions, in this red condition, this is uh, calcium flux when DRP has been deleted. And in black, we see baseline calcium transients when there's no apoptotic cells around, right? And the this is the calcium transient we should expect during phagocytosis. And you can see that DRP1's presence is needed for calcium flux. And this might be attributed to the mitochondrial bound uniporter, MCU, which is known to buffer uh, calcium. And what they found is that when they knocked down MCU in these uh, DRP1 deficient mice, in these, cre these mice, it partially restored the calcium transient. So this is what led them to, to believe that possibly MCU is what's responsible for um, buffering the calcium. So by knocking it out, we see increased calcium flux. They're not knocking it out, but knocking it down with uh, siRNA. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this paper. If you have any questions or want me to clarify something about the paper, I'd love to. And thanks for watching.